Hi, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our first Saving Your Family Treasures Facebook Live event. Uh, we're, we're very saddened by the circumstances that brought us together today, the uh, devastating tornadoes and the storms that impacted so many in the Southeast, but we're also very glad that you're here. I'm Caitlin Averett, the Cultural Heritage Disaster Response Specialist at the Smithsonian Cultural Rescue Initiative. Um, very quickly, I'd like to give you a little background on the program, introduce our experts, and tell you how our event will unfold today. Um, so as you know from our Facebook page, we are the Smithsonian Cultural Rescue Initiative. Our mission is to protect cultural heritage threatened or impacted by disasters and to help U.S. and international communities preserve their identities and their history. We support response work, put on training events, and conduct meaningful research both domestically and internationally. And for more information about what we do, feel free to visit our website. Um, today, a lot of uh, links and resources are going to be shared via the chat box here, so we welcome you to keep an eye on that as we post. Um, and I think we should just be sharing our Facebook information, or sorry, our website information right now. Um, all of our domestic work is coordinated through the Heritage Emergency National Task Force, which we co-chair with FEMA. NTEF is also a great place to go for additional resources. And we're posting some links um, to the HENTEF website and to certain fact sheets that will be related to the demonstrations that we'll be presenting today. Um, through this partnership uh, with uh, FEMA and the HENTEF, the Saving Your Family Treasures program was born back in 2016. Um, after a typical disaster, uh, we would conduct live demonstrations at disaster recovery centers in the affected area, and we would bring this much needed information directly to disaster survivors. Um, about a year ago, we started working with our colleagues over at Smithsonian Affiliates and have conducted workshops at affiliate museums across the country. And so at this time, I'd really like to take a moment to give a big thank you to our colleagues at Smithsonian Affiliates for once again helping us get this information to the people who really need it. And we'd especially like to thank those affiliate museums, um, Matt Davis at Georgia College Historic Museums and Wayne Coleman at Birmingham Civil Rights Institute as well as the Southeastern Museums Conference and the state librarians of the affected states, and everyone else who helped uh, share, like, link, and tweet about this event. Um, thank you for helping us reach our viewers today, you guys, the public, so thank you all. Um, in these times of social distancing and the coronavirus, travel and large gatherings are, of course, prohibited, but we still wanted to reach out to those who were impacted um, by the storms and tornadoes of the past two weeks. So during this presentation, Smithsonian experts will demonstrate easy at-home salvage and stabilization techniques using tools that you can get at your local hardware or grocery store. Um, this is just a caveat though, this is not conservation advice. Um, and if you're at all hesitant about doing these techniques on your own or have a particularly valuable or damaged piece, or if you have any reservations whatsoever, we recommend that you consult a converter. Um, so basically that's, that's kind of the gist of what today is. Um, uh, our experts will be joining us in a moment and they'll be talking about stabilization strategies for four different media, uh, books, photographs, paper, and textiles. Between each demonstration, we'll pause for questions, so feel free to type them in using the chat box. And we'll also save some time at the end to answer additional questions. Um, so on to our experts. Uh, Stacey Bowe is the training program manager at the Smithsonian Cultural Rescue Initiative, where she develops and implements cultural heritage emergency preparedness workshops, trainings, and educational resources in collaboration with many of the Smithsonian Cultural Rescue Initiative's partners. Rebecca Kennedy is the collections care specialist and owner of Curai Collections Care, nearly 15 years of experience and 11 of those at the Smithsonian. Rebecca has worked in preservation and collections management with a variety of collections in storage and on exhibition. Both Becca and Stacey have been holding Saving Your Family Treasures workshops since the very beginning, and we're very excited to have them with us today. So with that, I'll let Stacey take it away. Thanks. Okay, hi everybody. Um, now before I, uh, before you try out any of the techniques that we're going to show you today, um, you also need to be aware of your own personal safety. Um, when family heirlooms have been exposed to certain hazards or contaminants, you, while you're working with them, you don't want to run the risk of exposing yourself to those uh, contaminants. So um, one of the ways to protect yourselves is by uh, wearing gloves, which I will be doing today. 
uh, and you can use uh, a lot of different types of gloves. Again, you can research uh, which gloves might uh, be best for your situation on the CDC website. The other thing that you have to be careful and when family heirlooms have been exposed to the elements, such as flooding, they run a higher risk of uh, developing mold. And even though we're going to show you today how you can remove some of that mold, you don't want to, again, run the risk of exposing yourself to that mold while working with your heirlooms. So again, you know, um, consult the CDC website on different masks for different uh, situations that you're working with. And if you are working with your heirlooms and you either discover mold either by smelling it or seeing it, stop what you're doing and first uh, find that correct mask. So remember, personal safety is really key when doing any of these techniques. Thankfully, all of the stuff that we're going to be working with today does not have mold on it. So I'm just going to be using my gloves while I walk you through uh, some of these techniques. I'm going to start today with some uh, recommendations on how to work with photographs. Uh, everybody has photographs, I feel, in there uh, that are special to them uh, at home. And, you know, some of these techniques that we're showing you uh, can help you clean those photographs because a, a lot of the things that we see in a post-disaster situation is, are boxes of photographs that have gotten wet and they've started to stick together. So, What's great though, is that you can actually wash these photographs and hopefully that will allow them to unstick so you, then you can start to dry them. So I have my uh, two aluminum uh, pans that you can use for this work. And you would then put your uh, stuck together photographs into the pan with a little bit of distilled water because again, you wanna use um, as clean water as you can find for this work, because again, you don't wanna introduce more contaminants into your photographs. So you can let your photographs um, soak in the distilled water for an extended period of time. You know, let them, let them slowly absorb the water, work with them a little bit as they, um, as they uh, absorb the water, and then you can slowly, very gently, you know, start to peel them apart. But if they're, not, um, if they're not peeling apart, you can put them back in the tray, let them be, try again a little bit later. Um, if they have any gunk or anything on them that is not just coming off by the bath alone, you can use just a very soft bristle uh, paintbrush to gently remove some of that surface um, gunk off of the top of the photographs. And then you can also, you know, kind of wash your photographs in multiple baths to slowly draw out all of that additional um, uh, uh, gunk, for lack of a better word. The next thing with photographs, once you get them clean, is that you have to let them air dry. And you don't have to do any special heat. In fact, you shouldn't, you know, use blow dryers or any type of like heater to try and rapidly uh, dry your photographs. That's only gonna make them warp even more. Um, a well-ventilated room, uh, is a perfect place for photographs to dry out. Um, and the other thing with photographs is that you always are, you know, you are running out of space when you um, are trying to dry out a large amount of photographs. One way to create space for drying out photographs is actually you can hook up a clothesline where after your photograph has um, been washed, you can then just clip it to your clothesline and just let it dry. Very simple. Mm -hmm. There we go. The other way um, you can create space for your photographs to dry is by actually utilizing um, fiberglass window screen. And this is very important. This is the window screen that's very um, uh, malleable and is not the metal kind. This is the kind that you wanna use when drying out your photographs. Because if you use the metal kind, you run the risk of developing rust, and the last thing you want is to have rust on your drying photographs. But this stuff is great because you can, um, you know, tape it in between two uh, chairs and suddenly you have a beautiful drying hammock for your um, photos. I've actually taken another um, aluminum pan and I've actually uh, cut out a piece of that screening and have uh, secured it with binder clips to the top of my tray. And I 
and then I can actually place my wet photograph onto the tray, which is great because now air circulation uh, can dry that photograph out uh, regularly rather than it just sitting um, on a table like on top of a paper towel or something like that. So that's with single photographs. If you encounter uh, framed photographs that have gotten wet, the biggest thing that you need to gently do is remove the photograph from the frame, uh, which would be, you know, carefully pulling out the back, uh, the back support board, removing the, the frame, and drying each piece individually. The other thing you also have to be aware of is if your photograph has gotten wet, it's probably uh, sticking to the glass, and it really comes down to your situation. Sometimes we've seen photographs you know, gently slide off of the graph or the glass, but sometimes they do actually uh, stick and adhere to the glass. If that's the case, do not try to uh, uh, bathe the photographs. You unfortunately have to let it dry as is. And then we recommend once it's dry, you can actually use the uh, photograph that's been stuck to the glass uh, in a scanner and you can re-scan the image and create a reproduction of the photograph because that at least saves the valuable image that is on the photograph um, rather than trying to figure out how to remove it from that glass. Same goes with photo albums. You need to treat these um, as multiple different objects. So you have to kind of break it down into its individual pieces. So if you have a, fo if you have a photo album that's gotten wet, uh, we recommend that you actually cut the pages out because that way you can kind of focus on them individually. Um, so if you cut the page out individually, then you want to work on the, the individual photos. And again, just like glass, these plastic sleeves that you find in uh, photo albums have a real tendency to stick to the photos. So again, you know, break your uh, photos out and slowly work on them individually. You can take an X-Acto knife and cut along the edge of the photo in the plastic sleeve and slowly work it back. Again, if you're um, getting too much of a resistance from the photo and you're worried that it's gonna tear, let it be, let it dry out, and let's see if you can get it scanned um, later. Um, and I believe that's, uh, oh, one last thing for historic photographs. Um, again, uh, depending on what these, historic photographs have been mounted on, you want to, um, you don't necessarily want to bathe these very quickly. For instance, this photo that I have here, it's on a paper-based backing. You don't want to um, re-wash this because this paper backing might um, disintegrate. So again, you know, rather than hanging it up on a clothesline, put it face uh, flat and air dry, okay? And now I'm going to turn it over to Becca for textiles. Thanks, Stacey. This is Caitlin again. So we're just going to pause to see if we have any questions right now. Um, and I'm just scrolling through our Facebook live event. And it looks like everybody's really impressed with the techniques that you shared. So thank you for that. Uh, no questions yet at this time. But if you guys do have questions later on relating to the um, photograph advice that Stacey just shared with you, please feel free to enter those in the comment section and we can come back to them after Becca's section. So for now, we'll just turn it right back over to Becca. Hi everybody, um, welcome to the uh, textile layout. Um, by textiles, we mean uh, family heirlooms made out of fabric. So this could be uh, historic rugs, historic uh, family quilts, anything that's of uh, family value that is made of a fabric. So I'm going to give you a bunch of different techniques because these come in various sizes. So I'm going to start with something small. So we're going to go over a lot of the same techniques that Stacy already discussed, such as washing and handling of such fragile material. Um, fibers that you find in fabrics expand and become weak. So our goal here is to handle them as little as possible. 
So as you can see here, I have this uh, textile floating in what I'm considering contaminated water. So I have my PPE gloves on. Um, there's two ways you can handle them. I'm using the screen to gently lift and the screen acts as a sieve. This is the same screen that Stacy was showing you previously. One of the great things about this is that I can now rinse it and the three bath system to make sure all the debris is removed and all the contaminants have been washed away. Um, if for some reason I don't have a screen that doesn't work, I still want to make sure I don't, I'm not too aggressive with it. So I will be very careful and use both my hands to lift it up gently and let the water drain out. I don't want to wring it because wringing it is going to permanently stretch and break those fibers forever altering it. So I will show you how we're going to get the water out now. What I'm going to do is I'm going to make a sandwich. So I lay here the bottom of my sandwich. Um, it's just a plain white towel. If you don't have white towels at home and you can't get them, use any towel that you know is not going to dye or alter the color of the textile. So we need to get this textile safely onto the bottom part of your sandwich. And one of my favorite methods and things to use is from the plumbing section of the hardware store, and it's pipe insulation. Pipe insulation is great because it can get wet and dry very easily. It comes um, in different thicknesses to handle different weights, and it just is very pliable. I'll show you different ways to use it. So one of the things I want to do is create soft folds and gentle handling methods, as I mentioned before. So what I'm going to do is transport this textile out of its nice bath onto the bottom part of the sandwich and gently adjust it. I don't, I'm not going to be too harsh, not going to cause any strain to the fibers. And then I have cheesecloth. Cheesecloth is great at catching any bleeding dyes. So if this was made of um, multiple colors and they were running into each other in the water, this would actually keep that from getting worse. So a nice la layer of cheesecloth. If it's bleeding on both sides, you can put cheesecloth on the bottom and cheesecloth on the top of your textile. Then you put the towel over the top. You can use two, but I had a big one, so I can use one. And then I have a very handy um, roller paintbrush. And then I'm just going to gently push the water into the towel. This is much gentler than wringing it out. And we're not actually causing any stress on the fibers. It's just a gentle, gentle push. You don't have to put a lot of uh, force behind it to get it to work. And both, all of these are great because the towels, the paintbrush, and the cheesecloth are reusable. You just have to dry them out and do it and use them again. So you don't have to constantly be going to the store. So now we have a textile that is significantly drier than the dripping mess you just saw. Now I need to dry it off. Um, again, you could create a hammock like Stacy just showed you and have the air come from the bottom and the top for a slow dry. The slower the dry, the better because the fibers need to reacclimate and drying them out too quickly will make them brittle. So we can either lay them on a hammock or we can put them on a clothesline. So again, I don't want to manhandle it. So I fold it gently over my pipe insulation like this and, handle, and take it over to my clothesline. And one of the other great things about pipe insulation is they come pre-slit. So that way they can easily go over a clothesline. And we're, we're done, again, want these nice soft folds. So I can just gently transfer it from one pipe insulation to the next, and it's on a clothesline. And it doesn't take up a lot of space. Um, the pipe insulation can also go over chain link fences, over chair backs, on hangers, or anything like that. It's also really great for shaping. So if you have um, something wet, a wet hat, a wet shoes, anything like that, the pipe insulation can actually be cut down, easily manipulated, and can be placed inside of a hat to help it keep shape. And then you can just leave it like that until it's dry, making your life easier because you can go on to something else. Now, let's say you have something really large 
such as a rolled rug. Um, obviously, you can have one much bigger than this. The pipe insulation may not be strong enough, but you can still go to your plumbing section and get a large PVC pipe and run it through the center of the roll, and that will help you carry it. For rinsing, it's obviously not going to fit into these turkey basins, but you could get um, uh, kiddie pools or lay a tarp on a downhill slope, such as a driveway, and rinse it off. We usually prefer you use distilled water when rinsing things because it keeps chemicals from entering into your fabrics. But we understand in an emergency, distilled water is not always readily available. So um, tap water or water from the hose is a lot better than having um, uh, contaminated, muddy, or black water um, inside of your textiles. And one of the other things we often travel with, not sure if you can see this clearly, but it's just a clothes drying rack like you would use for your clothes at home. It works the same as having the porch screen. So whichever you have and available is easy for you. Textiles are very simple as long as you remember to not wring them out and carefully um, rinse them and use uh, distilled water if possible. So uh, any questions? Thanks, Becca. Um... I have a question for you. Can you talk a little bit more about what you might do with a garment such as a wedding dress or um, a, a uniform from a military service? Yes. So uh, wedding gowns and military uniforms, you would want to treat the same way. You want to make sure that they're rinsed out very clean if they're still wet or been contaminated. But again, the process and the big concern here is to make sure they dry quickly and appropriately without growing mold or becoming musty. And this again is where I love pipe insulation. Um, you can reshape the dresses and the uniforms using pipe insulation. I often would shove these into sleeves or leg holes, or you can make little loops with them using twill or wire inside of these to make the hoops on the dresses to make sure you get good airflow. And you can always have a fan circulating in the room, but not directly on the textiles. But the same thing, do a gentle rinse and then do a slow dry and use the tools around you. I mean, pipe insulation is about $4 for six feet and you, and you can chop it up into any size you need to do the stuffing out. And because it's meant to quickly dry and get wet and quickly dry and get wet, you can keep reusing it without having to go out and get more. So just when it gets soaking wet, put it on the sun for you know an hour and then bring it back in and reshape again. And you'll eventually get it to where it's, it's as good as new. Not as good as new, salvageable. <laughs> That's great advice. Thanks, Becca. I'm not seeing any other questions come up through our Facebook chat right now, um, but we can post it or bump back over to Stacy. Okay. You're up, Stacey. Can you all hear me? Yes, ma'am. Okay, just want to make sure. I was getting a weird uh, uh, alert from my computer, but great. If you can hear me, we can move ahead to books. Okay, so um, again, with all of these techniques, you since this requires a lot of you know brain power and concentration and time and energy, really you know critically uh, think about which books in your collection you would like to save. The ones that you can easily replace, um, you should replace them. These techniques that we're going to show you are for those books that are, you know, irreplaceable, those family copies of, uh, of, of cherished stories. Because the thing to remember with books is that they take are so and it just takes an extreme amount of time for them to really release all of that water so again you know take that into consideration when you're trying these techniques out and remember that patience is key so as we all know there are two different types of uh, books that are commonly found in our personal collections we have our hard covers and we have our soft covers so wet um, what's interesting is that if it was actually closed when it was getting wet, the 
actual interior of the pages, so like the actual middle part of the pages, might actually be relatively dry. What, the, uh, the water normally um, starts to penetrate the book on the edges. So when you're picking them up, you know, be careful, inspect where you think the water has gotten into. Um, again, you know, you can use uh, your trays with a little bit of distilled water and you can, again, grab your uh, brush. And if you want, just gently clean the edges. If there's like, you know, mud, dirt, other stuff that you just want to get off the edge, don't open it off. Just dip this in uh, distilled water and gently uh, brush the debris off of the edges of the book. Then when you kind of, um, if you're okay with how clean it is, then you can start to dry it. And there's a couple things that you can uh, do. If it's a hard uh, hardcover book and it's not too um, uh, sopping wet, you can actually balance it on its spine and just gently fan the pages out. And again, just like all of the other drying methods that we've shown you, you don't have to uh, uh, increase the heat or put a fan directly on it. Again, that's going to make the, the pages warp really quickly. Just a well uh, air circulating uh, room, let that dry out and, you know, check on it to make sure and monitor, you know, if it's really releasing uh, that uh, water. For uh, soft, uh, soft back books, um, you can't really um, uh, stand them up really well. I mean, if you can, go right ahead. But if you want to try the interleaving method, you can do that by, let me actually remove these. <laughs> you know, gently handling your book. You can place it on one of the towels that Becca was mentioning um, as a little bed for it. And let's see if you can see. I'm going to move my hard copy. There we go. You can place it on. Uh, a bed and using paper towels or any type of um, absorbent material and gently peel the book up and let it, you know, kind of talk to you. Don't force it open um, and be mindful of where it's uh, becoming a little weaker. And you can actually feed uh, paper towels and to kind of maximize your paper towels, you can actually cut these to the actual size of the book so you can get a little bit more out of your paper towels and just gently interleave them in between the pages of the book. You don't want to stuff the book too much because um, you might then cause more pressure on the binding of the book. Just let it, you know, just fill it up just to a nice amount of pressure and then again, slowly let it dry out. You don't have to put any pressure, you don't have to squeeze. Those uh, paper towels will draw out the water and then you can actually go back and rotate the paper towels in, so you're gently taking the water out of the book, which will allow the fibers to um, recover uh, a, a little bit. Now, again, like I said, books take forever to dry. And the thing is, is that if books are taking for forever to dry and they still have a lot of that moisture, like I said at the beginning, uh, you will have to be very, very careful that they're not developing mold. Books or mold loves to eat books. So if you're in a little bit of a situation where you don't have time to really uh, uh, dry your books out, but you still wanna uh, buy some time, you can actually freeze books. And freezing the books doesn't necessarily uh, negate the mold uh, risk, but it just pauses it for a second. So if you have a book that's still a little wet and you wanna buy some time and uh, by freezing it, you can buy freezer paper at your local supermarket. And this is, uh, you have to make sure that you get freezer paper. This is the stuff that butchers wrap meat in um, because this stuff is made to go into the freezer. You don't want parchment paper. You don't want wax paper. You want freezer paper. It's very, uh, very key. And then once you have your freezer paper, you wrap your book like you would uh, a present. You wanna be very careful and precise while wrapping it, you know, clean lines um, and making sure that that paper has a very nice, um, uh, has engulfed the book, you know, very uh, precisely. The tape that you wanna use, uh, we recommend using what's called exterior tape, because again, this is a little bit of a more durable tape. Um, it's meant to be used outside in the elements. So that means that it's actually ready to be put into a freezer. 
if you use other kinds of tape that aren't you know meant to be put into a freezer they actually might peel and not become sticky and then if it actually um uh loses its stickiness and you know un um peels away from your paper that opens up to air entering your book and then you get book freezer burn which is definitely something we want to avoid so um you can use either exterior tape there is actually freezer tape that is meant to close you know freezer paper so again definitely make sure that you're using the right materials when you are um, wrapping your books up so you can put these in your freezer and you can leave them there for an, for an extended period of time you know several weeks you know and that will give you time to take care of all of the other things that we're sure you are you know dealing with if you have had your house um, get hit by a disaster these can just hang out in your freezer, and then once you are ready to properly dry them out, you can take them out of the freezer, slowly unwrap them, and put them in that well-ventilated room and get them to dry again. Um, and that way, you know, they haven't been growing mold uh, for the entire time uh, in between. So that's my uh, presentation about books. Any questions? Yeah, so I think, sorry, I'm, <laughs> I'm checking to make sure that I'm not on mute now too, but I think I'm off. We did have a lot of questions come in, Stacey, so I'll give you some time to answer these. Um, so the first one is, what if pages are stuck together? And um, maybe you could talk about different types of um, paper that you see that might, you know, adhere more easily than others. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we unfortunately do see a lot of uh, pages sticking together you know um clay coated papers such as like um the most common ones you would find are like in magazines they are notorious for sticking together when they get wet and unfortunately there isn't a very good you know easy uh way to unstick them the the best thing that you can really do is just make sure that um, that book gets as dry as possible. And then we recommend you um, contacting a local conservator who could um, work with you on getting those uh, pages unstuck. Unfortunately, a lot of the materials that we have access to at home can't necessarily guarantee that those pages will um, unstick. But the biggest thing I would say is just make sure that the book is completely dry. And then you can you know, work with someone to get those pages unstuck. Great, thanks, Stacey. We mm -hmm. also had asked, what would we do if you had fire or smoke damage? And I'm just gonna acknowledge that question and say that we should come back to that at the end because I think that both Becca and Stacey can talk about um, fire and smoke damage for all these different kinds of media, but we'll, we'll come back to that one at the end of the discussion because that's a really great point. Um, mm -hmm. So I have another question. What about using freezer bags? Ah, freezer bags. That's, that's a good idea. The thing is, is that, um, Freezer bags can't um, provide the nice, like direct covering that paper can, because you know, unless um, you know, because you can't uh, uh, wrap it in a freezer bag, right? Um, and the last thing you want to do is to have air pockets around your book, because that's where freezer burn um, begins to happen. So the paper is really your best, uh, your best bet. Great, thank you, Stacy, and then. Our last question that we'll take for this section are, um, or is, can you write on the freezer paper, I assume, um, the name of the book? So basically, can you put, um, can you inscribe on the paper um, any notes or annotations that you need when you freeze it? Oh, definitely. And that's actually, I recommend that. <laughs> um, because then that communicates to you. Um, and if you're uh, as scatterbrained as I am, <laughs> it might help you in the future in identifying, you know, which books actually ended up in your freezer. Great. Well, thank you, Stacey. We're going to pop over to Becca. Uh, we've noted a lot of the other questions that have come through. So again, we'll come back to these guys at the end. Um, but for now, we're going to pop over to Becca. Okay, great. Um, I'm going to talk to you all briefly about paper, because um, we have a lot of documents and a lot of uh, letters that mean a lot to us. So we want to make sure we cover that as well. Uh, since we're just leaving Stacy talking about freezing, I thought I'd kind of jump into that topic um, first. If, if you come across a pile of papers that are soaking wet, 
and you just really cannot handle separating that out, drying them one by one, and you just need to freeze them, that is okay. You can actually take that entire pile of paper, wrap them in freezer paper, and put them in your freezer, and of course label them. Um, it, the same technique Stacy showed you with a book, and you can put the folder, everything, into the freezer. Um, and just have a plan for how you're going to deal with it when they come out of the freezer, which are all the techniques we're going to show you that we haven't shown you and going to continue to show you. But it is okay to freeze paper, um, and even in a big stack. It's just to buy you time so you all can deal with whatever you need to deal with now and immediately. But if you want to, if you have loose paper lying around and you want to um, save it, I'm going to show you those techniques now. As you probably have all seen, when a piece of paper gets really wet and you try to pick it up, it just immediately falls apart in your hands. So here again, we rely heavily on the porch screen, the very soft porch screen. It just really is easy to find and works so well in this situation. Even pulling the paper out of the contaminated water, we scoop it up with the porch screen and then we set up our rinsing stations. Um, as I mentioned before, we usually do three rinses, really dirty water to less dirty water because we're trying to get the contaminants off. And having it on the porch screen, the minute it comes out of the dirty water, we can literally take it from one area to the next and it never has to leave the porch screen. And therefore we really minimize the handling. And we always, again, and keep reiterating this, rinse in distilled water because we really want to make sure we're not adding any chemicals to the paper because um, those fibers can actually grow what we call boxing, which are those little brown spots that you sometimes see on paper that looks like mold, but it's not. It's called foxing. Um, and that's usually caused by some sort of chemical reaction in the paper. It's not a bad thing, but it's unsightly. Um, so that's what we're trying to avoid by using distilled water. And so as we're doing this rent scene and so forth, pulling paper out, we really just need to make sure it stays in one piece, either through uh, just the point we get to where you can scan it or just enjoy it later, um, even if it's not in perfect condition like it was before. That is our goal. Um, so two things can happen to paper in the water. Uh, one is it just becomes wet, but otherwise you can still read the writing. The other is the writing actually starts rubbing off. And that's um, what we call, um, it's soluble. The ink is become soluble. It's, it's running off in the water. And that is sort of a priority thing for you to get out of um, the water. Because you want to make sure you don't lose any more of that writing off of those documents. And if something is soluble and the ink is falling off, do not give it the bath and skip those steps and immediately go to drying because putting it in the bath, you're just going to lose more ink. You're just going to have to live with the fact that it's contaminated and he can put it inside of a plastic sleeve and just not really handle it in the future. Um, but skip the bath if the ink is running off. Really reiterating that because I don't want you to lose any more of this beloved document. So if it's not rubbing off, it's perfectly fine for it to go through the bath system. So now what we have is this document in one piece on this porch screen. And what we're gonna do again is make a sandwich. And what we're trying to do is get everything to dry but still remain flat. So we need to now get it off the porch screen onto the sandwich. Um, here I'm using paper towels, but you can also use blotter paper or um, watercolor uh, paper. They both work really well and they're white and clean. Because um, again, we're trying to not get that color transfer. What we want to do is get this document onto this thing. So I'm actually going to put this on top and then do an easy transfer. And then just gently peel the porch screen off. Ta-da! So now I have the bottom part of my sandwich and now my document. And then what I want to do is put another layer of paper towel on top. And then I want to make sure it dries flat and have the paper towel or the water paper do just pull, gently pull the moisture out of the document so that it's slow and the fibers don't become brittle. So I try to find an evenly distributed flat surface such as this piece of, can't really see it, but plexi, and um, put it over the top. And then I get something heavy like a book or a weight 
and put it on the plexi. And the plexi is distributing that weight evenly across the paper. So that way the paper towels or a blotter paper is doing all the work on the document. Um, if space is an issue, you can actually just make a taller sandwich, such as, I still have my sandwich here. All I did was take off the plexi in the book. And I'm just gonna add another document another layer of paper towels, another document, another layer of paper towel, another document, another layer of paper towel. Then I'll put my plexi back and my book back. So I've just created a taller sandwich. So here I have five documents all drying in this contained space and everything's going to come out actually fairly flat. The one hard part about this is that you want to prevent mold from growing. So your every few hours or as the thing gets drier, that uh, as documents get drier, that period will be expanded, but you're gonna have to switch these out, um, the paper towels out to make sure no mold is growing. Um, but at the same time, you are gonna have fairly flat and saved documents. So it's a fairly easy method. If you don't have a piece of plexi, you just need something flat. Um, and I'm just using a very heavy manual on safety um, something I could easily replace and I don't need to worry about. Um, if the document comes out really dirty and you need to agitate it in the water, you can actually use the same as Stacey was using, a very clean paintbrush. And um, that is pretty much it for paper. Again, look for things that are soluble in the water and skip the rinsing process. That's the best advice I can give. Um, any questions? Thanks, bye guys. Yeah, we do have a few questions uh, for you and some are popping up too. But the first one that I thought of is, what if you have some leftover dirt on the um, paper? Um, are there any methods other than um, a paintbrush that you could use to, to get it off? Yeah, so you just really need to agitate the paper as we call it. Mm -hmm. I mean, let me get one of my letters out. So when it's in the basin of the water, this is when paper is actually at its strongest. You know how we feel very strong and sleek and powerful when we're in a swimming pool? The paper kind of feels the same. So we actually just need to give it a gentle rub back and forth in the clean water um, because that's when it's going to feel at its strongest. So if the paper's kind of bunched up, folded over, you want to actually manipulate it in the water. And that includes getting off any loose debris. Um, so that's when you want to use the brushes on your water and you want to agitate it by pushing it back and forth within the basin and that's going to get most of the dirt off. Otherwise at this point you can wait till it dries then vacuum it off or dust it off and the way we vacuum it off is we again move to our trusty porch screen. In case you haven't noticed we love porch screen and a lot and, and pipe insulation throw that out there and we will actually put it over the document and then vacuum through the screen or put the screen over the hose of the vacuum because we don't want the vacuum to suck up the document, obviously. And this would be true for uh, textiles, uh, books, photographs, anything you vacuum, you need to have this barrier of the porch screen for mold as well. Great, thanks Becca. We do have a few more questions. Um, Julie is asking, are there any issues with the texture from the paper towel transferring to the paper while drying with the method that you described? There's usually not, um, but we don't get the, you know, the quilted kind, we get the very, the flat kind. I personally prefer the water paper um, or the watercolor paper, but there's not normally much of a transfer because you've got to remember these papers aren't going to be pristine anyhow. They're already, already going to have that, per, that kind of almost permanent wrinkle state unless you take them to a conservator for permanent flattening. But now we've not usually had a problem. Great. And then two more quick ones. You mentioned ink solubility and the fact that there might be some bleeding going on when these documents hit water. Can you tell me if there's any kind of test that you might do to see before you re-wet the pages? So that's a conservator who asked that question with that terminology. Um, <laughs> or me. <laughs> or you. <laughs> yes. So I don't, I don't have, oh, actually, hold on. Got 
Okay, I can't find it in my kit easily, but yes, there is a water solubility test you can run. And one of the things we like to do is if the document is out and you really want to know is we'll actually just grab a Q-tip or a cotton swab and we'll just dab it in the corner of one type of ink and see if it bleeds onto the Q-tip. That's it. You just pick an inconspicuous spot. If you have like a, like a diploma where two or three people have signed it, you want to check the corner of each of those inks because they probably all signed with a different pen. Um, so little things like that. So there's four or five different inks on a document. You want to do a small corner of each of them and you'll notice on the end of your Q-tip whether they're whether if there's any ink at all that is water soluble and you need to avoid reintroducing it to water. Great, thank you so much, Becca, that's wonderful. No problem. Uh, last one, just real fast about this topic is we were wondering if there are any alternatives that you could use to the plexiglass. Sometimes that might not be readily available. Yeah, so anything that's flat. I mean, I use um, just specifically because I don't have a weight or a weight or plexiglass. I've used just a one very large book. Cookbooks are great because they're usually really large and really heavy, so they'll cover the whole weight. What we're really looking for is weight distribution. So if you have um, something just large, that will cover the whole space. So it could be something pl uh, plastic, it could be something metal, um, could be pretty much anything, but something hard and covers the whole surface. Um, trying to think, looking around my home, if anything else could be used, but a piece of wood a place of plywood, just as long as it's large and flat and covers the whole surface and a weight could be added to it to help distribute that weight. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Becca. Okay, so we have a few questions here that uh, we can throw out that are a little bit more general and um, Becca or Stacy, feel free to, um, to, you know, I don't know, do rock, paper, scissors for whoever wants to answer them or something. <laughs> um, but the first one is, um, can one of you guys talk a little bit more about the general environment um, for drying that you would recommend? Uh, what kind of, um, you know, I guess sort of like, yeah, the general drying environment that you would recommend. Mm. <laughs> I, I can take that one. <laughs> The, um, the key thing is air circulation, because believe it or not, that actually will decrease your chances of growing mold the most, because mold needs time to, you know, find, find a place to uh, stick to. So if you have a nice gentle breeze in a room, that actually is going to prevent a lot of that mold from uh, possibly growing. Um, you also don't want to have a lot of direct sunlight, which, you know, none of your family heirlooms should be exposed to direct sunlight, you know, generally. And it's also the same for this case, too. Um, if you do have to move some of your stuff outside because, you know, you just can't keep it inside, it's okay to bring it outside, but just make sure that you've got like a covering or under an awning or even one of those like pop-up tents. And, you know, as long as there's a gentle breeze, you know, allowing your heirlooms to dry out, they should be, they should be pretty fine. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. Um, another really good question that we had that we were hoping we could answer for is um, what would you suggest you do if you have fire or smoke damage as well? And I guess this could apply to any of the different um, items that you guys discussed today. So once you have smoke or fire damage, the one thing that really changes is you don't rinse anything. Um, we kind of skip that phase because what, what happens when you rinse is you're opening the pores of that artifact or that heirloom. And once those pores are open, all that soot and all that smoke is going to go deeper into the uh, textile or into the paper. And, we, and that's exactly the opposite of what we want. We want that soot and smoke damage to come away. Um, so the first thing you do is just skip the rinsing. Um, there's some good resources online of how to remove the odor from soot um, and smoke. But one of the things we tend to use for actually removing it is cosmetic sponges are actually really good, the latex-based cosmetic sponges, um, and just do a gentle wipe away. Um, and then again, we also use the porch screen to go over them and to the vacuum it up. But just a reminder, because we'd be remiss if we didn't mention this, but um, smoke and soot is carcinogenic. And so we really want you to make sure you're wearing the proper um, uh, 
protection, uh, whether it's an N95 or a respirator or whatever the CDC or OSHA recommends when working around uh, smoke and soot and fire damage. But yeah, skip the rinsing cycle when responding. It's, it seems like you want to wash it away, but it's actually the worst thing you can do. Vacuum it or wash or wipe it off with a cosmetic sponge or a soot sponge, which is available at hardware stores. Great, thanks, Becca. I think that's really helpful. Um, one of the last questions that we had here is pretty specific, and I think Stacy, that this is um, this is going to be a toss-up between your photos or photographs presentation and Becca, your paper uh, presentation. Um, oh so they've got antique calling cards that are glued to paper and stuck inside a 50-year-old photo album. Um, how would you recommend rescuing these? Sorry, could you say that again, Caitlin? What, yeah, what sure. Uh -huh. Yep, there are antique calling cards that are glued to paper and stuck inside a 50-year-old photo album. How can I rescue these? Well, one, that sounds like a really cool heirloom. <laughs> so I'm glad you're taking the time to uh, uh, try to salvage it. Um, see, this is when I wish Becca and I were both in the same room. Um, well, can I jump in here really quick and um, say that for my, you know, my, uh, my two cents would just be, the first thing that I would recommend doing would certainly be that if you have a scanner or, um, a photograph taker of any kind um, to try to digitize this object um, before you do any of the techniques that um, Stacy or Becca might recommend. Because if anything were to happen to this, I think that just having, you know, um, a digital copy might be some of the most important things that you could do just right off the bat. And from there, I'll let Stacy and Becca go. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I completely agree uh, with what Caitlin said because, again, you know. Um, you really have to critically look at your heirlooms. What is it that's valuable about them? Is it the, the material or the information that they contain? So like Caitlin said, you know, if you want to preserve the archival information um, on those calling cards, scanning might be the best way to go um, uh, as your first step before trying any of these um, things. If the materials are important for you, I guess, um, and I'll, I definitely want to hear Becca's um, input on this as well. But again, remember that this is a you know a complex uh, album, so it would make it easier um, if you're able to break it apart. So if the calling cards have come unstuck, that's fine, you know, and let them individually dry. Um, and again, depending on, I guess, the, the makeup of the photo album, if you are able to separate the pages out, um, I would do so. Uh, because again, water, um, if, if, if it's been, uh, if it's gotten wet, water is really, <laughs> it's really sneaky. And it loves to hang out in places that um, you don't think it is. And that's where the mold can grow. So if you can just break that album apart as much as you can and let it completely dry, um, I would say that's the best bet. Yeah, so scrapbooks in general are very complex because you're dealing with multiple mediums between newspapers, calling cards, um, photos, all that stuff together makes it extra difficult. And while some might be okay to rent, some might not be okay to rent. So this might be one of those things that if you can't take it apart and it sounds like this might be one where you can't, you, it, it's probably better to skip the rinsing. And altogether, um, just take something like the freezer paper, or if you want to freeze it, line each page with freezer paper, and then fold it up, as Stacey was showing you with the books, and stick it in the freezer. And if not, put a um, paper towel or blotter paper between each page to keep, to start drawing out the moisture slowly. It's one of those things where when you have mixed mediums, such as, you know, uh, silk on a metal, um, pin, you have metal that's really stable, silk that's really not, you always have to take care of what's the most fragile thing in, of those mediums that are mixed together. So you have to look through there and of all the things that we discussed, what is the most fragile? And that's the one you have to kind of cater to when you can't separate things. But one of the best things you can do is line each page with an absorption material, let it slowly draw out the moisture. And if you don't have time to deal with it, line each page with freezer paper, fold it up like a steak and stick it in your freezer until you do have time to deal with it. But having, because I don't know what's on every page of the scrapbook, it's better to have that division. So that way 
you know, we just know it's not going to stick together. The bad part about putting it in the freezer is that adhesive, depending on what it's made out of, might give. So more things might become unglued, which is not the worst thing in the world because you can always re-glue them back on because they'll probably still have that brown stain where it was glued before. But it's just, it's just a technique. But the, the rule of thumb is just look at the weakest, most fragile thing in there and cater to it. And that's where you kind of have to go. Hopefully that's helpful. <laughs> Yeah, I think that's very helpful. Thanks, Becca. All right, I think that that is the end of um, our questions for this oh. session. I'm not really seeing too many more. Come, mm -hmm. um, I had a quick clarification about one thing. <laughs> yeah. So um, back to, and hopefully they're still uh, listening, but back to the person that was asking about, can you write on the paper, uh, the freezer paper? Um, I still stand by that you can, but actually a key thing I forgot to mention is that you should probably write it with pencil. Um, because one pencil is going to survive in a freezer environment a lot, uh, a lot more than pen or uh, other ink will. And also, if you use pencil, there's no risk in that ink, you know, um, bleeding through the paper and contaminating your book. So, um, so just a word to the wise: if you are labeling anything, use your pencils, not your pens or your markers. Great point, Stacy. Thanks for clarifying. That's wonderful. Okay, I think we're going to wrap up our presentation today. So I just want to thank everybody for your time and for um, tuning in with us. We hope that you found some of this information helpful. Um, keep an eye out on our Facebook account in the coming weeks. Um, we're going to be posting uh, a lot of this was about our response and how best to um, help salvage and stabilize your heirlooms after a disaster. But we're also going to be posting about preparedness in the coming weeks. So just some simple steps that you can take uh, to make sure that you're protecting your heirlooms uh, before disaster strikes. Um, and if you'd like to engage with us more in the future, feel free to reach out to us on any of our social media platforms. Uh, you can drop a line in this chat box here uh, or send us a quick message or email. Um, we did post some links throughout uh, the, the presentation, so feel free to take a look at those. And of course, if you have any other ones that you uh, could think of that you uh, might want to add, feel free to. Um, and yeah, thank you. Big thank you to Stacy and to Becca for your wonderful presentations today. You guys did awesome. Um, please uh, let us know if you have anything else that uh, you'd like to hear from us and we can uh, get back to you uh, individually. So thank you again, everyone, for your time. Um, take care, especially in these circumstances in these days. Um, and uh, we'll be around again soon. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>